Hi, this is Manfred Dillon from Beza Constrategy. I am really excited about this topic, attracting and retaining diverse talent um, for this Bamboo HR Virtual Summit. It's really exciting for me to bring together HR professionals who care about a topic that's so dear to my heart. In today's session, we're really going to focus on actionable items. And, you know, we keep hearing about diversity and inclusion, so we're not going to focus as much as on the why as we are going to focus on what can you do and what are the next steps you can take. My hope is that when you walk out of this session and I will walk literally, you know, off the computer, that you will have actionable items that you can implement right away within your organization. And at the end of the session, I will give you a website where a lot of the resources are available that you can have access to um, as, as needed as well. So welcome to the session. So in America, so this quote, I'm not quite sure where I got it from, but I think it's from um, Harvard Business Review. They had just released their article a couple of weeks ago and I have a feeling it's from there, but I didn't know, so I didn't source it, but it um, captures the gist of, you know, why diversity inclusion is important. So if you look at it in America, historical power in equities make it so women, people of color, religious minorities, disabled people, LGBTQ++ people are constantly reminded of their differences while men, white people, able-bodied people, straight people, and cisgender people can go on their entire lives without actively thinking about their masculinity, whiteness, able-bodiedness, heterosexuality, and cisgender status. Just take a moment and take that in. Some people in this world will never have to think about if they have an advantage or a disadvantage. While there's others that are constantly reminded about it, you know, in the way that they're treated, the co comments that they hear, um, in the conversations that they're having. And then there's others that will go their entire lives knowing that they have equal opportunity constantly, or they have, you know, an advantage constantly. So in this session today, we are going to focus on three key takeaways for this session. Building the case for a diversity inclusion strategy. Best practices for talent attraction and retention with diversity in mind and tools and resources to support the implementation of a diversity inclusion strategy. So get excited. But it is important to talk about why we're having this discussion. Diverse companies make better decisions 87% of the time because they have a diversity of thought and are 35% more likely to have above average profits and, and, and are more productive and innovative. Diversity inclusion leaders are more compelling to investors. They attract and retain better talent because 60% of job seekers do look at diversity when evaluating an offer. And that's just from, from Glassdoor. But that's a huge benefit to have diversity inclusion in your company. And think about that. If you, you know, it's right away, we know that there's a business case for it. The bottom line is impacted. So why are we not doing it? So what can we do to make it happen? As I mentioned, my name is Mampri Dillon. I'm the CEO and founder of Beza Strategy. Beza means connection and it's, in, it's a creation word for connection. And one of the biggest things that Beza Strategy does is connect people to their core, to their communities, and to others around them um, being, becoming global citizens. So our biggest thing is we help companies really look at how to retain better talent and retain the top talent, lower cost of turnover, and really help have a better employer brand. brand. And we do this through a strategic transformation firm looking at diversity inclusion strategies. And we really focus on the leadership for women with culturally diverse backgrounds. For us, women with culturally diverse backgrounds are the lowest on the pay scale. Um, sometimes making as low as 60% if you're Latino to 80% um, and if Blacks make 70%. Um, Asian women from Japan seem to make higher than white men, so that's a whole different case. But our whole, our whole mandate is how do we get equal pay and equal opportunity around the boardroom table for women with culturally diverse backgrounds. 
So the, a lot of the diversity inclusion work we do is giving an opportunity to underrepresented groups within organizations. We look at their HR strategies. We will look at work with the leadership team and do leadership training. And we also um, will analyze their policies and procedures um, and their employer brand to make sure it's a diversity inclusive and you know we create we'll spend some time more time looking at the models that we work through because it's about the presentation today and so my background a little bit just so you know who I am I grew up in Canada I was born and raised here to immigrant parents and my parents were amazing because they did their best the best that they could um, my mom was learning to speak English when she came and she was like 17 so she went to high school here and I remember when I was in I knew, elementary school and high school my parent my mom would say oh what are the white kids doing it was really looking at how can we fit how can we help the children fit in so it would be, our lunches would look the same so, um, you know she was conscious about what our lunches looked like she was conscious about oh, what TV shows we watched and she was also really conscious about how we dressed and not because she wanted us to have the best experience possible so we didn't really face a lot of racism. I personally, growing up, I didn't really face a lot of racism. I was very fortunate. The only time I would face racism is when, you know, they're like as kids, someone would have a fight and they had nothing else to say about me. So they would use a racist comment. Whereas my brother used to play ice hockey and he would face a lot of racism and it was used to as a common way to get him off his game. And then growing up, I, um, so I grew up in an area where there was only six Indians in my high school out of 533 grads. So I wasn't used to, no one really talked about the fact that we had a second language. No one talked about what we did at home. And it wasn't really until, you know, 10 years after graduation that we realized that all the minorities were hanging out together during high school and because we needed a sense of belonging. And then also none of, we also realized that we all spoke a second language at home. We never talked about that at school. And then throughout my career, I, you know, I started off in, um, in HR and I was doing a lot of, you know, cross-culture work and, in the arts community and looking at bringing cultures together through the arts. And I started to take the same principles into the, um, into organizations. And I started to notice that more we brought people's own cultures into the workplace, they felt a deeper sense of belonging. They were, felt like they were better understood. And then we, then, uh, you know, over the years, I've been doing some international work as well. And we've been working for different UNA organizations and really bringing, looking at how culture and gender influences decision-making, culture and gender influences work, workplace cultures, and really and how it in, really influences a person's mindset and what they decide to do with their career, depending on what their family background is as well. So a lot of the work that I do, I'm an executive coach. I've been a coach for about the last 10 years. And we really look at the mindset of individuals and how culture influences them. Because we know that that influences them in the workplace as well. It influences them how they, what promotions they're going to step up for, um, how they're going to talk to their managers. Um, are they coming from a culture where they're not able to say their opinion in front of people of power? You know, and it, it does impact them. And then we also look at how individuals, you know, what positions are they, um, how do they position themselves? How do they talk about themselves? How do they talk about their strengths? Because that also is influenced by culture as well. And then we start bringing in the other diversity aspects with disabilities um, and diverse abilities, um, with the, the genders. It's a lot of them have similarities, but different challenges as well. So we look and from with VESA, I really started to look at how do we get people to feel a sense of belonging and feel connected and feel that they are a part of something bigger. And that's actually all the work that, you know, as diversity inclusion consultants, that was what we do. And for so me, I went through the space where I didn't feel that belonging. So I've, I help others now feel that belonging as well. So I want to give you a little bit back around on me as well. So building the case for DNI strategy. So really the premise of how we look at diversity is it's different thought patterns, providing equal opportunities to people of similar skills, encouraging equal voice to all around the table, fostering understanding, creating a culture where everyone feels welcome and able to be themselves. Really, and that's what diversity inclusion really is all about. You know, it's not about um, what are the labels that we all wear. And it's not about the, um, 
sorry about the fire truck. <laughs> uh, there's, oh, you know, might be hearing that. Um, it is not about the labels we wear. It's not about the identities we carry. It's about the fact that we all have diverse experiences that we bring into the workplace. We have diverse experiences that influence our thought, diverse experiences that influence our behavior and belief system. And we're able to understand things from different perspectives based on these different experiences. And so it's really critical for organizations to have these diverse perspectives because once you have your internal uh, leadership team and decision makers represent the communities you serve, you will have a better understanding of your customers, of their backgrounds, of their needs, and you will be able to better communicate to them pro and give them products that actually work for them, hence making business sense and more profitability. So really, as we're looking at diversity, it's about the diversity of thought and creating inclusive environments within the workplace where people can feel they feel that their voice is going to matter, that they really feel that they're, um, they're able to, you know, fully be present with themselves and that they feel that they can fully show up and be the best aspect of themselves so they can be the most productive as well. So that's what diversity inclusion is going to mean as we go through the next couple um, minutes of this session. So when we're going to start is looking at um, the openness to diversity inclusion framework. And this is an assessment for framework for organizations and individuals to look at where they are on the um, along the way. Are they closed? You know, they don't view the lack of DNI as a problem. Are they resistant? They feel like we hear it all the time. We don't want diversity hires. You know, they're not the best candidates and all these things, and they just fill a quota, and that's what they're resistant for. They're, you know, they're not testing they're on board with it but they're not really sure of how to move forward they know that it matters they know that's something they want to do but they're not really to move forward they're supportive of it um, they're looking at ways to help other people feel included and engaged is that they really are fully engaged with implementing it with the team so this is a great um, framework that really allows you to assess where your leaders are within your organization assess where you are within the organization. If you're on this call, you're most likely in support or engaged. I'm just you know, putting that out there. And uh, some of you might be at the testing manner as well. Um, but there's, um, and also this openness to diversity inclusion, it really allows, allows you to see where the organization is as well. So this is a great starting point to, to have discussions. So when you are going to bring forward a business case for um, diversity inclusion and ask for resources, if when so you look at the different stages of these this development, you're going to position your business case differently. For someone who's under the testing phase um, and not sure how to move forward, you're really going to have to have a clear action plan on what that might look like. For someone who's resistant, is really bringing forward the business data, the productivity data, as well as with closed, you're going to bring forward the numbers. You know, make sure that, um, and then also look at, at, in the closed section, you might bring forward an employee survey, um, looking at candidates and who's applying for your jobs and what the pipeline, candidate pipeline looks like, looking at the turnover rates, that's going to help with the close and the resistant to really bring forward that diversity inclusion is important. And for someone who's at the testing phase and support phase, it is going to be about the action plan. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And how much money is it going to cost? So that's where you're going to start off with building the case for the DNI strategy. And then you're also going to look at the maturity level of the organization um, and what, how much have they done already. So the openness model, uh, openness to it, this framework, is really looking at what their mindset looks, looks like. And where the maturity level is, where they are at right now currently. And so with this one, if you really look at it, it starts with compliance. That's where you're meeting the legal and HR measurements. You're looking at, you know, the employment acts. You're looking at any statures that exist and you're meeting those um, acts within, the, within your organization. Discovery, um, this, you know that there's a change that needs to happen. You're not really sure of how to make that change, but you're ready to make, you're thinking about making a change. Some issues have arisen. Um, there might be, you might notice that the turnover has been high. You might notice that all the candidates are only from a certain pool that are applying to the organization. You might notice that a lot of new, diverse hires, they leave the organization within three months. 
So you're just like, mm, something's, something's going on here. Something's wrong. Why is it that these individuals don't stay longer? You know, and so you kind of look at where, what stage of the problem, what stage of the process is the problem at? Committed. Like you're taking active steps, uh, steps you put resources behind it, you have a, a person's position is allocated towards DNI, um, you have money going to DNI, you, you go out and then when you're championing, you might go and set best, best practices. You might have the best recruitment practices out there within your industry. You might be going out to job fairs where you're promoting girls to be in tech. Um, especially for innovative, that's really important. Like where you're actually already thinking about your candidates uh, pipeline for a couple of years ahead of time. And you're already encouraging women to go into tech or women to go into male dominated industries. And you're going there out there as a company and saying that you're hiring women. You might actually look at uh, developing up women's leadership programs with, within your organization where you have mentorship for them. Uh, you might also have where your candidate pools, you're partnering with all different agency within your local community to have diverse candidate pools as well. So that's where the maturity levels is and being assessment for that as well. And so diversity and inclusion has influences on three factors, retention of top talent, we, it's um, Canadian Statist, uh, Labor Board just released a statistic that 80% of employers um, think about how they're going to retain their top talent. 80%. And I know the statistics pretty similar in the, in the US as well. We're coming to a labor shortage in the sense of like with the change in generations, baby boomers, um, qualified labor shortage is going to be happening in the next couple of years, the next 10 years. And it's really an employee's market. So companies really need to think about how are we going to keep our top talent? So retention strategies are so important. And inclusive workplaces help with retention. How are you going to lower turnover? That's such an important piece. You want to make sure that employees, the cost of one employee leaving an organization is 1.5 times the salary of the employee. 1.5. That's huge. Because then you have, you know, as HR professionals, we see that all the time. Um, you're losing productivity. You're losing the training time, all those things. So we want to lower the turnover. Employer brand. Employer brand helps both both hiring and retention. When organ when people can see that see themselves within the brand, the employer brand, they're more likely to apply to the organization. And when they people can feel that feel a part of the brand, they're more likely to stay. So you want people to be able to see themselves and feel like they're a part of the employer brand, which is all your career pages, your social media, any of the publications that go up from the organization, the leadership team, what does that look like? Um, it's all important as well. So the best practices for talent attraction and retention is really about building a model of inclusive culture. So from this model, this is a VESA model, but we really look at how do you create safety and belonging within a workplace? How do you create a space where people can express their ideas, have a voice, and feel that they're heard? How do you diversity of thought? Or do you seek the opinions and perspectives of other people? Do you ask them what are they thinking? Do you ask the introverts in the room to speak up? Do you ask people who are usually quiet to have, you know, what ideas do they want to bring to the table? Understanding, recognizing people from different backgrounds have different experiences. So this is really key. Like thinking about it, like if someone from a traditional, um, you know, there's a story like I, we, and one of my old workplaces, we did this culture day. It was right with Koreans and the Korean person, um, her background's with Korean. And she's like, yeah, in our workplace, she goes, I wouldn't talk a lot in my meetings because I, I didn't feel like I was allowed to. And so, and her coworkers are like, but you still don't talk in meetings now. She's like, yeah, for me, that's a part of like my old cultural programming. So it makes it hard for me to speak in, um, our, in our meetings now. And when our team members understood that, they were able to ask her opinion more and they actually sought her, um, sought her opinion in meetings quite often. Using a strength-based management approach, really focusing on bringing out the best in each person, really focusing on what are the strengths of the individual and how are you, gonna, how are you going to focus on those and really delegate to them what they are feeling good about and whatever their weakness is, how do you, um, 
have other people kind of fill in or what do you do to minimize where people don't have to work in their weaknesses? How do you celebrate experiences? How do you celebrate wins? I mean, that's such an important piece because when people feel joy, they're more likely to stay in a, 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 an organization. How do you get to know people as individuals? Do you know what their family backgrounds are? Do you know what they like to do outside of work? That's where you really build a strong connection. Empathy and vulnerability is really, and it's about creating a space of where in conversation where people can feel that they can bring their feelings forward. They feel that they can really talk about what's really going on and how that's influencing their work. Because once they can talk about it, they're less likely to be influenced by it as they go on through their day because they feel that they're heard and they're listened to. So this is one of the best practices for talent attraction and retention. So we're gonna look at just tools and resources for best practices. So it's really looking at, we're gonna focus first on onboarding. You know, some key ideas that we're looking at is um, prior to their first day of work, um, how are you allowing, helping the individual feel welcome? You know, if they're from a different culture, from a different country, and your team's not expecting someone from a different culture before, how are you training your team to work with people from a different country? You know, it might be worthwhile just to do a little bit of um, research on if someone's coming from a different country and they're an immigrant, on what workplaces there look like and actually working with the team and then helping them understand them. And also like, what are the cultural norms of that country? Not saying that those people are gonna act that way, but when we understand it, we can see what might be, might be influencing them and actually kind of work to make them feel that they're included. And, you know, set up a mentoring program. You know, the first week I would set up a, men a buddy system where they have someone to have lunch with, they have someone to, um, they ask questions and setting up an informal system. And then setting up a formal mentor to someone who kind of guides them on who to ask what questions to, who makes the decisions within the workplace, and really understand their role and how to work with their manager as well. And then within the first week, it's about creating space so that they can meet the key team members um, within their team that they feel that they really belong. Most people with, will decide within the first three days if they're going to have a long-term future at their organization. So how do you make the first three days of our organization the best possible? And just remember, onboarding is for the first year. You know, how are you supporting the professional development? Um, how, are they, how are you allowing them to take ownership for what they want out of their, out of their career? How are you, you know, how is the organization meeting their goals as individuals for their work and for what they really want to achieve out of life? And that's where we really spend the first year. And then for the employer brand, you know, really some key questions to look at is, does your company's demographic represent your community? If it doesn't, it's time to make some changes. If the community and the customers that you are serving are not represented within your organization, you are missing out on essential information and data, and this is, could actually be impacting your sales. So it's so important that your internal, internal demographic of the communities uh, of your company, especially at the leadership team, represents your community. Then also look at does your website and all digital marketing represent diversity and inclusion? Do you, does, our, does the leadership team um, you know, represent uh, diversity? And is it, is it really forward and is it visible that they're diverse as well? Because the thing is, when people can see themselves in the leadership team, they're more likely to step up for promotion and step up for creating you know, more change in the organization because they feel that their voice matters. They feel that they matter. People are more likely to connect with role models and mentors that look like them or have had similar experiences in them that they feel like they understand them better. And so if you have any questions, feel free to, feel, 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 excuse me, feel free to email me at rampiabezaglobal.com. It was a very intensive and um, lots of information that I gave to you. And also please feel free to write down this webpage, www.bezaglobal.com backslash bamboo HR, where I'll be posting up some resources that you can use within your organizations to look at, to help you with your diversity and inclusion journey. I really hope to see you and hear from you. Please do feel free to add me on LinkedIn, send me an email so we can connect. And I would love to have a conversation with you on how we can support your diversity inclusion journey, 
You might just have one question or you might have a few and I would love to talk to you. Look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.